All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning to the team here, the crew, the staff, and all those of you who are online. If you are here or online for the first time today, why don't you just say hi and so that the rest who are regulars can welcome you there as well. So this is good morning. We had a good time of ascent this morning. And right now, we are going to go into our worship. Well, are you happy or not this morning? Are you happy? Are you rejoicing? Well, we should be. Because at least for the Penang people, uh, we have the SCMCO is lifted tomorrow. <laughs> but more than that, more than that, we should be happy because this month is Christmas season. Amen. And we remember, we just not just remember what we proclaim, Amen. that the King, the Saviour, the Messiah has come in the form of a child. And all the hopes and all the dreams of all the world and the prophecies and the promises of God all converge in this one child who will grow up grow up to be all the good that we are not and do everything that we cannot in order to save us Amen. and he the savior jesus christ has come so let us rejoice this morning in our savior our lord amen, amen. amen. joy to the world the lord is let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing.
heaven and nature see, and heaven and nature see, and heaven. To you, oh God, we look to you, a son of Jesus Christ. Yes, we look to you. Oh, we look to the sun. Come on, lift up your hands. Oh, we look to the sun. Hallelujah. Salvation tearing to the dead of night. See the kingdom cuts into color and the speed of life. Freedom shaking up the atmosphere. And the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears. Beyond the skies above, the reaching out. Shining like the rising sun Now forever, forever Let it cling up from death to life There's no fear in love Darkness in the endless light Kingdom come, see the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. Now forever, lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness in His endless light. Beyond the skies above. Reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Oh, 
son. Yes, God. Or we look to Jesus. Yes, God. He is the reason that we have hope. He is the reason that we can rejoice Amen. in every situation because He overcame. There's no king like Him. No king who would lay down His life Amen. in the way that Jesus did for us. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. A king like this, majesty laying in a manger. A king like this, unto us is born a savior. The light, the light has come. A king like this, the highest name and the song of heaven. King like this, born of flesh into our suffering, the light, the light has come. He is Christ the Lord. He is Christ our Savior. I bow my heart before. No other name I bow my heart before No other king A king like this A saving love that would not forsake us Betrayed by a kiss And led to the cross for our forgiveness The light the light has come a king like this a king like this a saving love that would not forsake us betrayed by a kiss and led to the cross for our forgiveness the light the light has come he is christ the Forever be 
of Advent, really, there is joy. There's joy because this Christmas thing is in the air. But what is Christmas without Jesus? Really, what is the joy without knowing the work of Jesus on the cross? And in fact, I must say this, that uh, the cross must come. That's ultimate the thing. And even before and after Jesus, there is the cross. And Christmas made it possible for the cross to happen because it is on Christmas Day that God sent His Son, Jesus, and to come down and, and take the sins of man and go to the cross that He may die, that we may be reconciled to the Father. And really, today, this morning, I, I, for me to take the communion in a season of Christmas, at a time when we remember the birth of Jesus is truly meaningful because this is where it all started. Before the cross, is about Christmas. Before the cross, it is about Jesus coming on earth as a child saviour. And this is where it all started and we will want to remember this this morning as we partake of the communion. I trust that you have the elements, the bread, the wine with you at home, so get them ready. And I want to read a few verses for um, all of you. It's taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. I'm going to read five verses, reading from verses 14 to 18. And these are the very words of Jesus Himself. And He said this, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down on my own accord. Hear this again. No one takes it from me. The Lord Jesus says, I lay down on my own accord. I have authority to lay down. I have authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Now, these five verses encapsulates the very essence of the very joy of Christmas, the very meaning of Christmas ultimately, because Christmas ends in the cross. And here the Lord Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I've come, I've laid out my life. Nobody can force it upon me. No one. I lay it down willingly because I obeyed the Father, because of the compassion for all of us people, of the world who are helpless and hopeless without Jesus, without the cross. And here he says again, that I come, that I lay down my life, and I'll take it up again, take it up again, so that all of us will have life, life eternal. And, and this is the very essence of the joy of Christmas. It all began at the manger where the child saviour was born. So this morning, as we partake of the elements together, we want to be reminded that the birth of Jesus is not the end itself. It is the beginning and it ends in the cross. And ultimately, with the birth of Jesus, we have the joy because we have life, life abundantly, abundantly, and we are reconciled to the Father. So if you have the elements with you right now, wherever you are, at home, you can take out the bread and uh, as well as the cup. Hold it in your hands and uh, we are partake of it together. Huh? We are reminded of the words of Jesus again. He says, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread 
and after he has broken it and, and given thanks, he says, take it, this is my body which is broken for you. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we want to thank you again that on Christmas Day is when love came down. That on this day, on that very day, 2,000 years ago, Father, you sent Jesus into the manger, a lowly birth, but with such significance because from the lowly birth to become the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And Father, thank you for that, for asking that you have direct Jesus to take that journey to the cross. And thank you, Lord, for that obedience. Ultimately, at the cross, at the cross, this is where everything happens. At the cross, we are all reconciled to the Father. And this is your commandment to us that when we take off the bread and drink of the wine, that we will remember your death and be identified with the death of Jesus and the cross. That on the day when, when Jesus was risen, on the day we will, be, we will rise with Jesus again. That we will have conquered death because Jesus has conquered death on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for the work of the cross. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. As in this season of Christmas, we are reminded again that the birth, your birth at the manger, ends in the cross and ends in all glory for you. We partake this together. We thank you, Lord, for that sacrifice, that love, all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take of the bread together. And of the cup. overwhelmed when I think of what Jesus has done for us, for dying for us, for coming. So as we go into December, you know, the month of Christmas, as we meditate on what Jesus has done for us, let us just respond to God. Let us draw near to Him. Let us come to Him. Because His love is so great and His love is so precious. You know, in, in Psalms it, you know, 36, it says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. And in verse 7, it says, How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. I think words fail to express, you know, really how remarkable it is to be loved Amen. by our Creator God. How remarkable it is to find our salvation in Jesus because that blessing is not just for now it's Amen. for eternity Amen. let's draw near to Him swept away by the wonder of your love how one so great cause love is one so small when I realize the distance between your heart and mine, I'm amazed when you call me to your side. I come to you, not in my own strength, but in me.
other way that we will come to you, Lord, except in humility. After all that you have done, you are the King of kings, Lord of lords, our Saviour. We are your vessel, your servant. Father, thank you again for the reminder as we sing this song. Again, that this is a season, Lord, of, of love, of really of what you have done for us. And we continue to stand in awe and stand amazed. Father, we can never fully understand the significance of this and what you have gone through, we can only know to a certain extent up in our head, feel in our heart. But Lord, ultimately, when we come face to face with you again, when all this is over, when this side of heaven, everything is over, when we stand before you, Lord, then we begin to understand a lot more. Thank you, Lord. It is a time, a time where we are looking forward to, where like, by Lord, we'll see you face to face. Father, in all these things, Today, right now, this season, forevermore, we just want to be a people of God to continue to understand and, and to go out and tell the people about the love of Jesus because there's no other way. Lord, we know we can never repay what you have done and we can never do more than what you have done for us. But whatever life that you have given to us in this time, in this season right now, we will go out and tell people the true meaning of Christmas, that this love of God that reconciling back to the Father, that we can have life, life abundant, that ultimately our sins are redeemed because there's nothing else we can do. And it all began in the manger when Jesus came, came as a baby, as a child saviour. Thank you, Lord, all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, worship team. You know, I always say this, you know, it's... Uh, so important to have great worship uh, because great worship really, it is pivotal, it is integral to us drawing ourselves uh, to, closer to Jesus, you know, to the presence of God. It is really, at the end of the day, central to us experiencing God's presence. It is always in worship. And um, it's always a, really a wonderful time. We are so blessed with a wonderful worship team right here in GBC, and uh, really thankful that we will start off with, well, on, on a high, connected, and before we come into a time to, uh, of His Word. Huh? Let me give you very quickly a few uh, GBC news here. The first one is a Wednesday prayer meeting. Again, I, can I encourage everyone to uh, sign in this Wednesday? It is really a, a time we really need to come together. Huh? and really pray. There's no better time. Every time is always a better time. But I believe in a season like this, all the more we need to come together and seek the Lord and pray. The next thing uh, that we have is the tithes and offering. We have uh, tried to make it simple for us uh, so that we can um, give of our worship. Uh, part of it is the tithes and offering. And uh, you can actually send in online or you can use the e-wallet uh, Touch and Go, which is our latest uh, avenue for you to uh, make your tax and offering. The next one we have is the GBC COVID-19 fund. We have had this fund for a number of months already. And this is open to those uh, members of GBC and regular, visit regular members, regular worshippers in GBC. So if you are someone who is uh, regular and you are in some form of financial difficulty, you need help, we are here to help as a church. Uh, 
So I can I encourage you, you just have to uh, contact Kwai Heng, the telephone number is up there. Uh, and we can assure you that your, this will be kept confidential. Uh. You talk to Kwai Heng about it and he will uh, assess it. And we will really love to help you, maybe to tie you over for a few months, uh, whatever needs that you may have. Uh. And the next one is, yes, uh, this is our Christmas Day. Uh, which is on Friday, December 25th. It is a night service, 10, sorry, 7.30 p.m. night service. All right? We have actually scaled back some of the things that we plan to do. In fact, we have actually uh, not scaled back, we actually cancelled the things that we want to do. A few months ago, we, we planned a number of programs that will run through the four weeks, starting from this week. Um, However, we are not able to carry out because we were half expecting that we will be locked down and uh, we won't have physical service. And the programs that we have in mind are largely interactive. So if you don't have people in service, there's no point having those programs. So we have actually cut back on all those things, but we will still have a service. It will still, I believe, it will still be a wonderful service because uh, it will be one, I, I trust that we will have an encounter, a time where we really need to come together and remember the birth of Jesus. And uh, so make time for this, uh, uh, December 25th, 7.30 p.m. Now, we do not know whether we can have in-person service. Hopefully, we can have. Uh, in person, if not, then uh, we will go online, all right? Okay, can I have the next one? The next one is the discipling the city in a new season. This is the inter-church prayer meeting organized by Prayer United Penang together with uh, Penang Ministers Fellowship. And uh, we, we felt that uh, this is a season we need to have one of, this, one of these meetings, uh, prayer meetings every month. Uh, Churches need to just come together and just pray and seek the Lord. And uh, if you remember, those of you who have signed in last month, we have uh, Pastor Dr. Philip Lane to speak to us. This month, uh, December the 14th, we have uh, Pastor Edmund Chan from Singapore. We are so thankful that these uh, very busy people, they have uh, agreed to make time to really uh, speak to us and what God has been saying to them. It will be interesting, I trust, you know, something that we will learn. And from out of what he shared with us, we will pray right, with the other uh, believers, body of Christ from other churches in Penang. Okay? Uh, that's all I have for this morning's uh, GBC News. And, you know, uh, I must say that those of us who are present here, we really miss all of you out there. Uh, viewing online. We really miss you. Uh, we wish everyone could have been here. It's been a wonderful time uh, that we have worshipped worship the Lord uh, right here. We do not know uh, what it's going to be like next Sunday. We are waiting for further directive uh, from the state government uh, as to whether we can open uh, for physical uh, service. So we will know by end of this week, we will inform you. If we can't, we will have online. We can we would love to have you all back here for in-person service, okay? You know, on a uh, beautiful, sunny Sunday morning in uh, late spring in May in 1968, in a church in Germany, a Holocaust survivor was asked to give his testimony to share of his experiences while he, the years he spent in the Nazi concentration camp. Right. So this guy, he came up, he walked up, and uh, his whole expression told the story of a suffering of his experiences in the camp. In fact, his whole disposition spoke more than his words, tell more story than his words. You know, he, had, uh, he was trembling, as he talked, you know, he was so traumatized and uh, it was written all over his face. The amazing part has been that it has been more than 20 years. This was in 1968 in Germany and more than 20 years since the war ended. And yet he was still so traumatized and it could be seen all over his uh, face. And so 
there he has, he went up there, he spoke uh, for a while. You could sense from his words there was so much uh, anguish and uh, fear. He was even trembling as he recalled the incidences. He had first-hand incidences of his uh, torture, as well as have seen friends and relatives who have actually died uh, under the torture of the Nazis. And uh, so after him, he came down, and then the pastor of the church called another person to come up and to share her experiences. This person is, uh, is a woman. Uh, she's a, a woman and uh, also a Holocaust uh, survivor. And uh, she came up to speak. She was in her mid-70s, broad shoulders. But she contrasted with this man. You know, it's one end of the scale to the other. She was so calm. She had a face that radiated love and peace and joy. She had such a demeanor. She had such a disposition. So angelic in every way. And as she shared and she spoke, there was so much of a confidence, of peace, of joy. Yes, it was uh, painful. She shared of some painful experiences of personal torture, as well as what she saw in the camp of how many of the other Jews were tortured. So it was a painful uh, relating of those events. But yet, yet, she was calm, she was peaceful. And uh, the interesting part was that both the man and the woman, both of them had been the, at the same concentration camp. And both of them went through certain experiences, not exactly the same, but nonetheless, one came out traumatized 20 years later. The other came out with such a peace and love and, and joy of the Lord. There is such a significant difference. Uh, the man had a nerve-wracked disposition over him, whereas the woman had this uh, angelic disposition all over her. And this is the difference. And who is this woman? Corrie Ten Boom. Corrie Ten Boom was born and raised in Amsterdam, Holland. And uh, she came from a family of watchmakers. Uh, Corrie was a passionate believer together with the, the whole family. Uh, they live a life that is, was really true to their faith. And she spent a large part, a number of years during the time of the, the Nazis, when, when the German Nazis invaded and conquered the whole of Holland and especially Amsterdam. At the height of the Nazi persecution, she and her family hid Jews in their home. And that was a very dangerous thing to do you know, in that time. So they hid uh, Jews in their homes for a number of years until she was finally caught and found out. And as a result of which, she was sent to the concentration camp. The amazing part about this woman was that not only was she bold in the light of the persecution, in the light of standing firm on her faith, believing this is what the Lord has led her to do to hide the Jews. But what was really amazing was that she has such faith in the God that she worships, faith that the Lord will take care of her. Whatever come me, you know, let, let it be, you know, that kind of thing, believing that God will ultimately see to her and watch over her. And whatever God decides, let it be. That is a kind of confidence, that's a kind of faith in the God that she worships. Corrie Ten Boom is an ordinary woman used by an extraordinary God. You know, among her famous words, she wrote some of these things and it's kind of interesting. And she said that never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. And how relevant it is for us today right here. And I'm sure all of us here would agree that the future is very uncertain. Wherever you are, whoever you are, in any part of the world that you live in, the future is certainly uncertain. We do not know what it's like. Six months' time, can anybody tell us what it's like? No, none of us can, not even the politicians, not even the scientists. They, nobody can tell us what the world will be like six months' time, a year down the line. We do not know. We talk about vaccines, and we do not know how this will pan out as well. So, and he, this was really, you know, was written decades ago, but it's so relevant today. Never, you know, you, you never be afraid to trust an unknown future. That's where we are in right now, you know, right in a season where the future is truly unknown to a God that is known. We have journeyed with our God. For me, I've journeyed 40 over years. Some of you even longer. Some may be shorter. Nonetheless, 
all you need to do is just a journey, uh, even a short journey with our Lord, and you will know that He can be trusted. You can trust your future unto His hands. And the next thing that she said was this, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And it's true. And very often we worry about things, uh, everything and anything. You know, some of these worries are certainly valid. But really, the sad part about our worries is that more often than not, you have no authority, no power to change those things. Worrying will not change those things. It will not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, of your problem, but it will sap you of your strength today. And then it says this, it is not my ability, but my response to God's ability that counts. And this is important. It's not how gifted I am, how experienced I am, how good I am, what I can do for the Lord, but ultimately it's how I respond to God's call and God's empowerment in my life, and that's important. And Corey Tambun has got more than that, a number of these. Uh, I chose three because these three are relevant to my message this morning. And these are the words of Corey Tambun that, that, that were fashioned out of a, a journey. I would even say an exciting journey, walking with the Lord, journey with the Lord in the darkest of times, especially in those times when she was in the concentration camp. And uh, she will always testify in her biography, you know, in a book, she always testify and say that God has always been with me. God has always been with me. And this morning, I'm going to speak on if God is with us. If God is with us. And I'm going to draw uh, from the passage here a uh, few verses that's taken from uh, Judges chapter 6, the story of Gideon. I know many of us are familiar with the story of Gideon. There are a few things that I want to uh, highlight and draw some of these verses. I have it up here on the screen for you. Uh, taking from, uh, reading from verse 12, Judges chapter 6, verse 12. And here it says, When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Wow. You know, I tell you this, church, if you hear God saying this to us, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. That's it. Everything counted. The rest of the things, you don't have to worry. This is really the assurance that beyond all assurance, the mother of all assurance. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, uh, this is a valid question, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out uh, up of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And then it says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Verse 15, pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Now, that's a very tall order. Uh, strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. And uh, later on, you, you have the story of how Gideon uh, put some tests before the Lord to confirm his assignment. Eh? Let me quickly give you a, a bit of background to these verses before I draw some lessons that we can learn. You know, if you read Judges and from the end of uh, chapter 5, the last uh, few verses, you'll find that chapter 5 ended with this uh, evil person, Caesarea, uh, killed. Caesarea was a commander of the army of the king of Canaan. And he was an evil commander, oppressive and when he was killed, and uh, after that, Israel had peace for 40 years. And of course, a period of peace, there was peace and prosperity for 40 years, you know, over the land. And as in the case, it's always the case, whether you read it in the New Testament or even of today, you know, when the land and the people experience tremendous peace and prosperity, what happens? Evil reigns. Somehow, idolatry comes in. Other things come in. Sin comes in. You know, in the, some of the most prosperous nations of the world are some of the nations where you see the most hideous things, the most uh, debauchery that you see, you know, without naming those nations. And today, you're seeing some of the nations of the West. It's amazing. When prosperity and peace is upon that nation, 
these things come in. Israel was no different. And don't laugh at Israel because it's happening all over the world and in every nation and even in our time as well. So when there was this peace and, and prosperity, then chapter 6 opens up with this statement where it says that the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. The Lord gave the Israelites into the hands of the Midianites. Now, the Midianites are powerful people. They are oppressive people. They are desert dwellers. They are, they are pretty primitive, but they are pretty good with camels. They actually are known to ride camels uh, in, into the war, uh, war time, you know, to fight their enemies in the way that the Egyptians will ride their horses. They use camels because they are desert dwellers. So they... They will use the camels, they will come, and, and then when they need any supply, anything, they will come, they'll invade from the desert, they'll enter into Israel, they'll invade Israel. And then they will destroy the crops, they'll kill the animals, they'll take the spoils of the war, and then they'll return home. And then when they need something else, they'll come again. So Israel will never know when the Midianites will come. Suka, suka, you know, they come. And then after that, two, three days, okay, then suddenly they come again. You know, it's very irritating. Not only it was said, uh, devastating. Not only was it, you will be fearful, but living under such conditions is horrible, you know, you don't know where it comes. You know, it's just like right now, we live uh, one, day, one day, we say, oh, one week, oh, green, oh, then suddenly 50 cases come out, oh, lockdown again. And you don't know what's the next week like. And then next week, suddenly, oh, every day, oh, week green, and then January, lockdown again. You know, uh, but, but this is really nothing, uh, in a sense. I'm not trivializing the pandemic, but compared to what Israel went through, it was horrible. Every now and then, a few days, I don't know, a few weeks, a uh, few days, the Midianites will come and then they will go after them. It's a horrible time to live in that season. They would, they would just come and the Israelites will have everything destroyed, their crops and all that. The Israelites were so weak, there was nothing they could do. They, they couldn't fight them, you know, these, these guys coming with their camels. And so the Israelites cried to the Lord, they said, deliver us, Lord. You know, all this, we, we really can't take it, deliver us from the hand of the Midianites. And then, this is the verse, verse 11, the earlier verse, uh, which uh, was not there earlier. And here, the, it tells us, the angel of the Lord came, after Israelites cried out to the Lord, and says, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash, the Abish right. Uh, Abish right is the father of Gideon, where his son Gideon, Oh, sorry, Joash is the is name. Abisrite is the tribe, the clan, rather the clan. Abisrite is the clan within Manasseh. Right? Joash was part of Abisrite and is the father of Gideon. It was, and Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Here it is. You know, that statement uh, that Gideon was threshing wheat uh, in a wine press to keep it from Midianites spoke a lot already. Because you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. Wine press is an enclosed area, and uh, you know, it is where you put in the grapes and the people, the, the, normally it's the ladies that will step, step, step on those wine and uh, crush it and make juice uh, and uh, extra flavor, you know, step, step, step. So they extract that and that, that, they, that's how they make wine. That's a wine press. But wheat, you don't do that. You trash wheat in the open. You trash wheat in the open field and where there is, a, there is wind, there is breeze. Because when you trash wheat, you are separating the, 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 the kernel and then the shaft, and then the wind will, will blow and set aside the shaft. So then you have the kernel of the wheat. So that's what you do. You don't go to a white press and do like that. It's, it's a lot harder. And it is believed that he probably did it at night. Sir. Why? Because afraid of the Midianites. Sir. You do in the open field, the Midianites come, that's the end of your wheat and you've got nothing to eat for the next one week, or even the next season. So they've got to do it quietly in the white press, and that speaks of the terror of the kind of uh, uh, scenario that they live in. And here we have this. You know, the interesting thing is, from all of Israel, from all the clans of Israel, from all the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes, from all the mountains and the seas and the valleys of Israel, from everywhere across, the Lord's eye would have searched the entire whole of Israel. And of all persons, he chose Gideon. Of all persons, he chose Gideon. And really, from every man's viewpoint, Gideon was the wrong choice. 
And all, how often when we read the Bible, when you read the beginning, don't read the end uh, or the middle, you find that God seems to choose the wrong people. Uh, Moses was the wrong choice, it seems. David was the wrong choice when he was a shepherd boy. And Gideon was the wrong choice. Everybody seems to be the wrong choice. And God doesn't seem to know how to choose people. That's what we all think. Uh, and it appears that Gideon was the wrong choice. Why? But Gideon's father was Joash, the Asbirite, the tribe of Manasseh. And Manasseh was, if you remember, if you know, Manasseh was the first son of Joseph. Joseph had two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. And uh, Manasseh and Ephraim was incorporated into uh, one of the 12 tribes. Uh, they were from the two tribes, uh, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, after Jacob adopted them. They were not the direct son of Jacob, they were the sons of Joseph. Uh, by grace, Jacob adopted them in into his, uh, as uh, one of his uh, own sons. So they became part of the 12 tribes of Israel. However, they've always been referred as the half-tribe. It's not very nice. You are half-tribe. You are half this, half that. So they were not really, uh, uh, yeah, no, they, they were kind of looked down. And also know that uh, Manasseh's mother was Asenath. Asenath was an Egyptian, actually. And uh, so here we have the descendants of Manasseh. And to rub it in, uh, Joash comes of the clan of Abyss uh, uh, Right. And uh, Abyss Right is a clan within the tribe of Manasseh. And, and that tribe has been known to be small, very small. Right? And Manasseh is one of the smallest tribes, not the smallest. The smallest tribe is Benjamin. Let me show you a map. Perhaps this will give us a good idea of the location of the, uh, uh, yeah, of the uh, land uh, distributed among the 12 tribes of Israel. Although Manasseh was a half tribe and was uh, not one of the biggest, however, they got among, among the, all the 12 tribes, uh, among the biggest lands that they've got uh, besides Judah. And you notice there's the East Manasseh and West Manasseh. However, the land that was allotted to Manasseh are not prime land. They are largely forested, uh, the one on the west of the River Jordan, and uh, the one for, to the east side is uh, desert land, largely desert land. So here you have a situation whereby they, are, they inherited those land and they have to till it. Uh, and, uh, it wasn't easy. Eh? But the interesting part about the land in Manasseh, the, the west side of the land, is that right in the middle of it sits uh, Megiddo. And Megiddo is believed to be the site of the Armageddon. So this is where it is believed that Armageddon will be fought in, in the land that belongs to Manasseh. And um, why was Gideon not the obvious choice? Eh? Verse 15 says it all. Huh? And he says that, Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least of family. Weakest in Manasseh, his clan is the smallest, and yet he's the least in the family. The least in the family can mean that probably the youngest, huh? just like King David. Huh? David was the youngest as well. So for that reason, Gideon was a tribe of uh, Manasseh. And, and, and I have to say this, Manasseh has, has not been known to be a tribe of fighters, unlike Judah. You know, in the time Israel war, we always a Judah. Judah will always take the lead. They are, they are men of, uh, they are fighting men. They are brave men. But Manasseh also has been known, although they are relatively small in proportion to Judah in particular, they are also known to be men of valor. And King David actually owed a lot to Manasseh because at the time when King David needed an army to fight alongside him, when others had abandoned him, and it was Manasseh, the tribe of Manasseh, that fought alongside King David at Ziklag and uh, recovered everything. Uh, that is important. So King David actually had a, an, an affinity to this particular tribe because this tribe stood by him at the point of need. There were not many of them, but they were known to be men of valor and very loyal. To, to King David. So that, that is the one good thing about uh, Manasseh. Okay. And secondly, you, you know he came from a tribe that uh, is small, the clan that is small, he's insignificant. So these are the reasons as to why it, it doesn't appear that Gideon would be a logical choice. I suppose if God were to choose someone to deliver Israel, 
he will probably have to go to the tribe of Judah. And among Judah, you know, there will be many men, you know, well-built and strong and fighting men. But he chose someone like Gideon. Eh? The Lord's reply to Gideon was very clear. He says, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the right person. I'm not suitable. Why, why me? And what was the Lord's reply? He says, I will be with you. That's all the Lord said. That's all Gideon needed to know. And this is interesting. You know, the command assignment was, hey, go and strike down all the Midianites. Leave none alive. Wow, it's so easy to talk. And then he says, I will be with you. That's all. I will be with you. No strategies, no plans, no further words, nothing else. I will be with you. Go. Lah. You know, that's what the Lord says. Of course, when it comes to a lot, it matters a lot. Nah. How often do we think that God makes wrong choices, picks the wrong person for the job, and, and all the Lord needs to say is, I am with you. And that's all. No? And, but nonetheless, if you look at scriptures and you look at uh, the Bible, especially to the Old Testament, you will realize that the first people that God chose, certain character traits emerge later part, not immediate. You know, whether it's Moses or David or Gideon, you will notice that certain character traits emerge, becomes clearer. And then you begin to say, wow, now I know why God chose this person. You, began to real, you begin to realize this after a couple of uh, chapters down the road. And uh, you realize this when you read further, you know, in chapter 7 of uh, uh, Judges. Uh, there are many characteristics that God looks for in choosing the right person for his assignment. Uh, I will only highlight three here. Um, and I, I thought these three are important as I apply it later on to, to us, to our lives. The first one is God looks for dead people. Dead people, and obviously I'm not referring to clinically dead. Huh? If you're clinically dead, then the Lord got to revive you before he can use you. But I'm talking about people who, are, who, are, who died to self. People who died to self, and certainly not everyone is considered dead to self uh, that God uses. Obviously, God uses all of us. Huh? Not all of us are dead to self. We still have some self uh, in us, there's still something in us that surface occasionally. That's why God finds it so difficult sometimes to, to do the work, uh, His full work in us. Because we need to be such a yielded vessel, we need to really have be dead to ourselves, really die to everything else for, for us to be a powerful vessel to be used by God. But I don't believe I've uh, really come across anyone who's really completely dead to self. But it is important, though we are still work in progress, we are not completely dead to self. However, we must not be full of ourselves. That is the opposite of dead to self. Eh? Dead to self one end, full of ourselves is another. Full of ourselves basically means that we are very self-satisfied in the wrong way. We, are, we, we, we need to be satisfied, right? In the spiritual contentment, we should need to be satisfied in God, but not in the satisfied in yourself completely. Wow, I'm so myself. I'm so happy with myself. Myself is good enough. That's all I need. It's just myself. And it's an exaggerated a uh, sense of self-worth, and that is the fool of ourselves. Huh? So, there are four important character traits here of someone who, uh, who's dead to self. He, he's someone who's also, his willingness to submit to authority, to people placed above him, to submit to one another. A main characteristic of someone dead to self is, is the spirit of submission. The second thing is that they consider others better than themselves, as obvious. The third one is they're always willing to learn from others. And, and that's important. You know, I'll, I'll tell you this. You know, sometimes I'm seated down here and I get one of the younger preachers who come out and preach. You know, and sometimes I say, wow, you know, there's really some things that we can learn from them. In fact, there are more than some things that you can learn from them. There are in... in the, the way they, they come across, the way they, they articulate certain, certain points, it was fresh. It was really fresh. I, I mean it. It was really fresh. The, the, the younger set of preachers who come in, they ask something. I say, oh, I, I, never, I never saw it that way. You know? it, the facts are the same. The points may be the same. But it is a freshness, the angle in which they come. And there are some things that we can learn as well. So we can learn from anybody, even people who are younger than us, people who have traveled a uh, shorter journey than us. We can still learn from them. And uh, someone who is dead to self is someone who is always positive about people and always respectful. Now, this is interesting because when I first started my first job, uh, the first week or so, uh, I was in financial services. My boss called me in and said, you know, Liu, they call me Liu in the office. Uh, and 
my boss said this to me, it's interesting. He says, Leo, I want you to know this. In our line of work, huh, you must look at everyone with suspicion. Everyone is a potential fraud. It's a potential swindler. And that is a, that is a basis platform to start in your credit evaluation before you decide whether the person qualifies for credit. What he says, you must, you must take it with more than a pinch of salt. And you must investigate. And, and that is where we should stand. Uh. So after all these years in financial services, one thing I must say, while that kind of value yeah, is important, it's important in the way we, we try to prevent uh, the company being swindled or us being swindled, it's kind of good and don't be so trusting. However, let me say this, it's a bad value to embrace in church and in the kingdom of God. You know, uh, it's always suspicious of people, critical of people. That is a very bad value to engage, to embrace. Out in the world, it's okay. You know, in church, I, 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 I remember uh, Pastor Prem Kumar, those of you who know him, uh, the late Prem Kumar went home. He, he said something to me, uh, uh, that, or to some of us, that was pretty, I, I thought, uh, significant. He says, you know, he, he gives uh, money to uh, someone who come and ask, who tell some stories and all that. So I once asked, hey, this guy uh, simply tell you some story, you, you, you just give her like that. You, you shouldn't investigate and all that. Ask. And he said this to me, he says, doesn't matter. Lah. You know what? Doesn't matter. If he wants to lie to me, cheat, I'd rather err on the side of grace and mercy and love. Let that person be accountable. You know, I, uh, I'm not giving him 1,000. I'm giving him that 50 ringgit, 100 ringgit. Let it be. Lah, you know? I'd rather make a mistake. I make a mistake. I err on the side of grace and love and compassion. And for all you know, it may be genuine, and one day he may come to know Jesus. And if for the 50, 100 ringgit, is cheap. Wow. I, I thought that was full of wisdom. You know? um, and it's true. So this is how in the church sometimes, yeah, we, 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 get, we, 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 may, we get people, people think that church people are gullible. No, sometimes they think they're gullible. Wow, you know, we can easily get some money out of it. Uh, but I, I, I want to see another way. It's not that we are gullible. It's just that we, we want to err on the side of compassion and love. Uh, of course, we are talking about giving 1,000 away. We want to ask a few more questions, huh? or 5,000. But if you are giving 50 ringgit, 100 ringgit, it's okay to err on the side of compassion. Huh? So, uh, people who, have, who are dying to self, not dead to self, are dying because we are the process of dying to self. It's really someone who can love people unconditionally and something we all have to learn. Uh, and people who have an erring desire to, to really uh, see the good of others because they, they are the ones who have really been uh, dying to self and that's important. The second characteristic is pliable people. Pliable means bendable, flexible. That's called pl pliable. You know, I used to grow bamboo plants in my home and uh, you know, bamboo plants are very interesting for all of you, those of you who know bamboo plants. I can leave early in the morning. That was years ago uh, when I was still working. When, uh, I'm still working, so I meant when I was in the corporate world. Uh, I'll leave office early in the morning, and I can see my bamboo shoot about two feet high. And then I will go to work, and I'll come back. I normally come back late at night. When I come back at night, it's about seven feet high. In a day, they can grow five feet. Wow, that's amazing. No? Wow, it's kind of interesting. Imagine I was thinking that maybe I should put a camera there and, 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 and you know, uh, videotape it. And that's what they do. They grow very fast. In that 12 hours, they can grow five feet. And that's a bamboo. You know, and bamboo is an is a, is a interesting plant, although it can be pretty messy. You know, when they are young, you can actually bend it. They bend it the other side and make some structure out of it. That's what you can do. And you know, Chinese New Year is coming, you've got this little bamboo plant. Uh, they bend here, bend it there, they make structure. So it can be very beautiful. But the thing about bamboo is that it matures very fast. Within two, three weeks, it grows old, and you can't bend it anymore. You force it, it breaks. The stem will break. So the thing is, are we like that? You know, the bamboo plant reminds me of us and all of us. You know, uh, as we get older, sometimes we find it harder to change. It's our paradigm, our worldview. 20, 30 years, I've been doing like that. 
church will be also like that. You know, that's why in the, in, when you do recruitment, huh, Johnny, huh, do recruitment, you don't, you don't want to hire a 50-year-old and a 55, 60. Although him, I may tell you, I got 40 years of experience, but I'm already set in my ways. I come in, I set in my ways. I'd rather take in a 25, 30-year-old, I can mold the person. That's what we all do. Huh? So we, we are, as we go older, we, we find that we are so fixed in our ways and whatever that we do. You know, uh, there was a time uh, years ago, I find very hard uh, to attend a church service where it's all dark. I, I find very hard, not used to it, uh, you know, all dark, but now I'm kind of used to it. You know? For those of you at home, you may not realize it's actually all dark. <laughs> and the people are enjoying it, we are enjoying it. And it's, I was telling myself, it's so difficult to preach into darkness. You know? I, can't, I can barely see your faces, especially when the lights are on me. Uh, I can barely see your faces, so I need to use a tablet because it's light, otherwise I can't see. And so, and I, I, years ago, I find it very hard to take in loud music, but now I'm okay. Whether it's loud music, soft music, whether it's uh, fast music, slow music, songs, whether it's completely bright, completely dark, I'm fine. I'm already learning to adapt. So, you know, there was a time at the start of the MCO and uh, towards the middle in May, June, where we had to come and do recording. I, I struggled to speak into a camera. Uh, there was nobody who was in a room at level five. But now I'm used to it. I can speak into an empty room. Uh, people may think I'm crazy if I can speak in an empty room, but I know that you're watching live stream, so at least uh, trying to use my sanctified creative imagination that all of you are looking at me, which I hope you are. Huh? Okay. Anyway, so, uh, and, but you see, the thing about us is this. We have Jesus in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We should be able to regenerate new shoes. We should never say, I'm like that, really. I cannot change her. Uh. You cannot change me. You can't say that because the Holy Spirit should be able to change us. Because the Holy Spirit in us will regenerate new shoots out from us. So we become bendable, flexible. I'm not saying flexible in terms of compromising. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the message is the same. The holiness is the same. The purity is the same. The Bible is the same. The Word of God is the same. I'm talking about flexibility in the way we do things. The method changes. The message is the same, right? So we should be able to be flexible in a different season. I'll talk about it more later on as I conclude why this is so important. To, to do different things in a different season, uh, what we do today, right now, it's not something you can do in the 1980s. Or 1980s, you can't do it now. Or for that matter, even now with the lockdown, you can't do what we used to do one year ago. So things change, huh? So we have to be bendable. If we insist on doing things our way and we are not yielded, we are not pliable, we can't be of much use to the Lord. And the, the last, uh, the third point I want to say is that bold people. You know, God is looking at people who are bold, uh, not reckless. Uh. There's a difference between bold and reckless. Uh. You need to be bold but not reckless. You need to be measured. You need to know it's of God. You, you, you need to be uh, firm. You need to know what you're doing, uh, not just simply going around doing things that are on your own, uh, on your own understanding. You have to be bold people, bold in the Lord. Let us be imp important and qualify this, bold in the Lord. You know, God's assignment is people not only to be obedient, to carry out, but to show faith and boldness, to see that it is carried out successfully. In this season in particular, with just so many uncertainties and challenges, uh, really, and it's so unprecedented, we are called to venture out to do new things, to try new things. We have to try new things, you know, if we keep on insisting on the ways of old and, and, and in the safe and tested matter of yesteryear, then we may miss out something of what the Lord wants to do. You know, the, 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 the things of yesteryear of God, not that they are no good, they are good, but many of those things belong to the yesteryears. And in this season, it is different. So that requires moving in a fresh new way, moving into uncharted, un tested territory, you know, and that calls for boldness, you know. To go into uncharted territory calls for boldness. You know, we all feel very safe when we do the same old thing year in, year out. But suddenly when we have to do things in a different way and different approach, different strategies, different methods, it, it, our comfort zone is taken away. We are very comfortable doing it in the same way. And we need to change in that, right? Like Corey Ten Boom, he carried out God's assignment without fear. And even while he was in the Nazi concentration camp. And all that God did in Gideon's case was just to tell him, mighty warrior, I am with you. Hey, that's all. 
That's all he needs. No need of any other thing. Just think. And he heard it right. He was correct. So he, he went on. And, and the assignment is that he is to kill all the Midianites, leave none alive. It's a tall order you know, to strike the Midianites. As he said, they are on their camels. They are wild people. They are aggressive people, oppressors, to kill all of them. And all you need to hear is God is with me. To kill with what? That was my next question. You know. What would he kill with and with who? But that was all that Gideon needed to know. And so, after looking at all this, what can we learn actually to draw from uh, what we have just read on Gideon? There are a few things I'll draw up as I, I want to just uh, draw in together and say how would it apply to our, this season. And right now, especially, we are in the first week of December into the season of Christmas. You know, the one thing that we need to know is that God uses tough times to get our attention. You know, it is said that pain, suffering, and tough times are God's megaphone to a death world, not only to the church, but also to the world at large. You know, I like what C.S. Lewis said. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a death world. We so often miss God's gentle whisper in our good times when we are filled, we are full, when we are happy in our work, in our career, when we are so contented in our family, when everything is so nice. God whispers and talks to us in a still, gentle voice. For some reason, we missed it out. You know, uh, there is... Uh, and, and, and why, why do we miss it out? And very often it's because of the busyness of our life. In, in, in our pleasures, in our good times, we are also quite busy. Huh? Uh, whether we are busy with our handphones, busy with our Netflix, uh, what else? Busy with our social media. Um, I, I can't see all of you, uh, and certainly those online I can't see. You know, in, in times like this, uh, if it's bright and everybody's around, I would be able to see some people put their heads down. And then I will know. When I say Netflix, some people put fix. Ah, this is a Netflix for handphone. Others will put down. So you, you can get a gauge of the congregation. What are the sins? <laughs> these, are the, these are the things that really draw us away from, from God. Huh? You know, just as God used the Midianites to wake up Israel, God used the Midianites to wake up Israel, to wake up his people. Is God now using the COVID-19 pandemic to wake up His church and to wake up the world? Is it God's megaphone now to the church? Hey, you know, to a church that's been deaf, to a church that has been busy with many things and uh, doing our own things and all that. This is something we really have to uh, consider, huh? look at. There's an interesting detail in Gideon's story that struck me. I'm not sure how much it has really, uh, you have actually picked this up. You know, Gideon, the Lord said this, he says, for seven years, the Bible tells us this, for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Seven long years, he, God, gave the Midianites, uh, gave Israel into the hands of the Midianites. He says, seven long years, it can mean two things. Uh, number one, it can mean that it's been seven years and then before Israel cried out to them. Right? And at the end of the seven years, though the Israelites were tolerating, still would want to call out to God until really, really seven years cannot tahan already. Oh Lord, help us. It could mean that. All right? So after only seven long years, the Lord, uh, the Israelites call out to the Lord and the Lord then called Gideon. It could also mean that the, the Israelites have been calling out to the Lord from the very beginning. But for seven years, the Lord didn't answer them until after seven years. Then the Lord decided to call Gideon. So seven years, Israel had been crowned to the Lord. There was no action from the Lord until after seven years, the full seven years, then the Lord decided to call Gideon. I tell you something, church, either way, it is bad. Either way, it is bad. Whether it is the Lord allowing it for seven long years 
Israel has been crowned to them. Then only he decided to act. And then he decided it's the time now, after seven years. Then they have learned a lesson. You have been crowned to me for seven years. Now, okay, the time is now. I will act. The other thing is equally bad. Seven years, these Israelites do not want to call to God. They tahan, tahan, try to live through and hope that it will pass. And then only then they call to the Lord. I've been thinking about this in the context of a pandemic, you know. Uh, the pandemic is only one year. <laughs> I hope it won't go to seven years. Uh, I don't know what 2021 will be like. Uh, many people feel that it will, large part of 2021 will not be much different from 2020. I'm not sure whether the church has been crowded to the Lord. So I'm wondering whether, do we need to crowd to the Lord for many more years because the Lord still wants us to learn something? before he will relent. Or we are still not crying to the Lord, and the Lord will allow it for a while, maybe after seven years. Then, oh, cannot die hundred, seven years pandemic, lock in, and all this. Only then we cry to the Lord. Either way, it is bad. So it's something for us to think about. But the crux of the matter here is really, what is the Lord saying to the church in this challenging season? It was a megaphone, definitely. The Lord is now shouting out to the church, through the pandemic and waking up a church, whether it's slumbling or it may not be the whole church, but some people who are slumbering, the Lord is also crying out, shouting out to those out there who do not belong to Him yet, the non-believers out there, to the world out there who is complacent with life. Imagine, it's, for many people, life has been so good. It takes a one tiny little this microscopic virus to change everything. They're all, a lot of people, what they have built in all their life in the better few months, crushed. And all it takes is a little tiny microscopic virus. So what is the Lord saying to us in this challenging season? The second thing that we can learn from Gideon is that God confirms His work with His presence. When the Lord sent Gideon, He confirms His assignment through His presence. It is always that way. When God gives us assignment, individually or as a church, His presence will go with us. He will not give us assignment and leave us desolate. Whether you hear Him or you don't hear Him, the fact is that if that assignment is of the Lord, you can be assured that it's always this, I will be with you. And it will be lovely if you can really hear it, that the Lord says. Uh, and, and, and one of the hallmarks of God releasing assignment to us is the inner weakness. That is the presence of God, the inner weakness in us to confirm that this is what the Lord is asking us to do. Ob the other thing, obviously, it will be wonderful, it will be lovely if there's someone else who can confirm that assignment uh, to you. Huh? You know, if someone else, you know, you know uh, this is this, you know, like Catherine, you'll be called to do something and then someone comes alongside you and says, yeah, Catherine, this is what I sense, that the Lord, this season and the next few seasons, the Lord is calling you to do this. And if it confirms what you are currently doing, what is in your inner weakness, where God is already saying to you, that would have been wonderful. Uh, that would have been that kind of confirmation and reassuring. And the next one is, you know, private faithfulness is a prerequisite to public office, uh, public usefulness uh, used by God. It is clear that Gideon would have been a worshipper of God, uh, of Yahweh. But this is interesting, you know, because his father is, uh, is, has worships Baal, so it's uh, idolatrous. But can you imagine the whole family and the community are idolatrous? Which week, but uh, you read further on uh, in, in later part, chapter 6, chapter 7. And, and yet he is not. And then his first assignment was what? To tear down the family altar. Wow. This is serious, man. For a child like that, and uh, I don't know whether he could be youngest, he could go and, and go and tear down the the altar of Baal, and that is serious. And he did that, and he almost got himself killed because the community came after him. But amazingly, Joash, the father, came to his defense. And this, is, this has to be God. This has to be God. That's why God says, I am with you. No, people will not touch you, not be able to touch you. So here we have that there must be a certain faithfulness of Gideon in his private life. He must have been a, a worshiper of Yahweh or in his own and that's where God of all whole of Israel, through the mountains and the valleys and the plains and all the clans and all the tribes, he saw Gideon. 
he must have seen the private life of Gideon, the private faithfulness of Gideon that qualifies him for the public assignment, the office. And, and that is important. So our life, inner life, must be right before God we can, before we can undertake any assignment. Fine, and the next one is impact is determined by God's empowerment and not ours. Clearly, the impact is totally dependent on God and powering in our assignments. And even if you operate in our natural gifts, it's our natural, you know. Some people are born to sing, some people are born to talk, some people are born to just work, you know, rock their sleeves. It's, it's a gift. It's, it's still of God, you know, and all that. Ultimately, but your gift will make great impact only and when it is God's empowerment. And you, you don't just operate out of your own, out of your own ability. Yes, you can go a certain level. Uh, you can go a certain level, but beyond which you, 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 you can't. I, I believe I may have shared this uh, account with you. Something just came to mind uh, very briefly. We won't talk too much about it. You know, it's, uh, um, many years ago, I've, uh, when we have this South, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, South uh, Congregation, and uh, we will preach our message in, uh, in Central, which is in number 14, and then one or two weeks later, we'll take it to South to preach. Same message. And uh, that was... I, I preach in Central. That there is a message of the Holy Spirit which I preach so many times. I preach it so many times already. You know, here in teaching, in in, in uh, prayer meetings, and all that. I spoke about it so many times. And then when I was supposed to do it in in South, you know, uh, at that time, I was overconfident. I was I was that was about twenty years ago in the nineties. I was overconfident, and I the night before I didn't prepare. I, I didn't look through. It was already prepared. Uh, I didn't look through. Next morning, I go in like the kind of big time speaker. I went there. I tell you, my message was completely flat. The people were so confused. I could look at them. They, were, they, don't, they didn't know what I was talking about. I also didn't know what I was talking about. I remember Jenny was a worship leader at that time. And I cut halfway. I said, Jenny, uh, can you take over worship? I went down. And you know, after the service, Soon Hock, Pastor Soon Hock pulled me out. He said, Jen, what? You're going to learn from this. You're going to learn from this. Wow. That was a rebuke, a very strong rebuke. And that was wonderful. I learned my lesson. Anyway, he didn't have to rebuild me. I learned my lesson that I can never take it for granted. I need to prepare. I need the Holy Spirit's guidance. Even I may have preached 50 times, whatever number of times, doesn't matter. I still need to prepare. I still need to pray. I still need to be right before the Lord. So now, every Saturday night, I will spend a few hours spending that time. I have to, uh, besides other days, uh, obviously, there were other days also preparing. I have to, because I learned that since that day, I'm, I'm already worried. I, I knew that I could not, no longer, depending on whatever flair that I have. Wow, come here, Taro, already. You know, I have spoken so many times, I just said. Completely flat. I was so surprised. I was so confused. Ultimately, this is a reminder to me. How much impact we can make really depends on how much we tap on God's empowerment. It's not about us. It's about Him ultimately enabling us. And um, this is important, something that we have to remember. And you know what? Interestingly, you know, the, uh, Gideon first amassed an army of 32,000. God said, no, 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 too many. Eventually reduced uh, through a few steps to only 300. You know, this, this verse is very telling. He says, the Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. How on earth? Uh, I don't understand this. You want to take on a big job, a war, a fighting against this kind of this fierce people. You want as many men as possible. If I can get the whole of Israel even better, how can I think of reducing my men? You want to join, you want to join, good. I don't care whether you are house skilled, as many as possible, just charge and uh, go after them. But the Lord said, no, 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 you have too many men. I cannot deliver into your hands when you have too many men. This seems like a, a, a contradiction. And he says, uh, the second sentence will explain it, or else Israel will boast against me. My strength has saved me. You see, when you have so many men and you outnumber your enemy and when you win, then you say, eh, yeah, 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 God is good, God is with us. But ultimately, inside, it's, it's us. Huh? We've got superior weapon, we've got more men. You know, ultimately, that's where it will work against us. So ultimately, at the end of the day, it's not about the numbers, it's not about what you have. It's about God's empowerment. And this is a very clear indication to all of us. The verse says it all. 
God's enablement. We cannot claim it's done in our own strength. Now, let me as you draw this together, let me talk about two things here. What is the assignment in the list of what in the midst of what I've shared this morning and spoken of this morning? What is the new assignment God is giving to the church this season? And I believe, you know, over the you know, I've been struggling with this since MCO uh, in March, staying at home uh, almost to myself in a room. I've been thinking and thinking and praying and seeking the Lord. You know, in, in all these things, what is God saying to us? What was the church? What's the new assignment to the church? I've been wrestling through this. And over the months, I've been wrestling through. And, and because of that, and thankfully, uh, by God's grace, I, I was also uh, pulled into a few discussion groups uh, uh, all over, not just from Penang, but from other states. All, you know, various ministers and pastors were wrestling with this question. What is the new assignment God is giving to the church this season? What is the megaphone uh, that God is shouting out? What are the words that God is shouting out through His megaphone to the church today? And this is something we need to know. And I, it came upon me that really, ultimately, is going back to the basics. Really going back to the basics. This, this season has challenged the church to be more missional. Going back to the Great Commission of Matthew 28, going out to make disciples of nations, of people groups. And I believe it involves taking the church out to our communities, impacting, transforming communities. In that many ways, it is not new. That, that is actually our GBC mission statement, you know, impacting and transforming communities, part of our mission statement. Uh, and, and it's something we, we, we do know. But the question is, are we do anything about it? You know, it's up in our head. You know, at the end of the day, we can say, yeah, 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 I know about this. But it's, it's pretty of no use uh, if you only know it in our head. And the next point is that no longer about building churches, but about impacting communities. It's really taking a kingdom mindset, a kingdom paradigm. It's not just about, not that buildings are not important, but really the emphasis today is not so much about building uh, bigger and bigger buildings. Really, it's about people going out and sharing the gospel. You know, uh, one senior pastor told me this, you know. He says, this is a time uh, whereby maybe all the churches uh, have more or less a level playing field. Well, yes, a good worship team is good. A good live streaming equipment and all that is wonderful. But uh, these are the most important things. Because if a good live streaming... Uh, we, we are actually attracting maybe a lot of people from other churches coming over to watch. But perhaps what is more important is people going out to share. You know, I, read of a, I, I know of a case whereby a, a church in, mega church in KL, uh, this church numbers about 3,000 plus people, uh, total congregation of a few language groups. But their total viewership for each, sum, each Sunday is 6,000 over. It's almost double their congregation size on an in-person service Sunday. So, which means that there must have been a lot of people from all other churches at Clang Valley elsewhere, maybe in Penang, watching their live stream. But I tell you, the pastor did something very right. The church did something very right. You know what they did was that he actually organized a seminar to empower all other churches, smaller ones, how to run live stream, how to do it well, train them, and, and even equipment-wise, even helping them if there's a need of financial resources, he actually helped them. He wants them to build up their live stream so that, and he tells the other church members, don't view ours, go back to your home church. You should always go back to your home church. That's not what we want. We want to build our live stream so that, well, yes, so that we can have our own people watching. That's one thing. But if you can bring in non-believers through the live stream, it's interesting. People will watch. Yes, that's important. You know, you're saying, if, imagine if the 3,000 extra people that view their live stream are all non-believers, it would be wonderful. But if it had been our people from other churches, it wouldn't have been good. So really, at the end of the day, really, at the end of the day, the church today, the power lies in its people. If the people will go out and, and share the gospel and bring them to the live stream uh, service or in person, whatever, that would be wonderful. So in a sense, Huge church buildings is not going to be a lot of advantage at this point in this season. And the next thing I want to deal, uh, talk about very briefly is uh, what is God's mandate to individual believers in this season, to each and every one of us? How does it affect us? I think it's very clear now 
that for each and every one of us, we need to step out and step out even more. It has always been the case. It has always been the case whereby we need to step out and step uh, out. But all the more right now, I believe the Lord is sounding out His shofar. He's sounding out His megaphone to the church through this COVID-19 pandemic. You know, it's not about staying home. It's about reaching out to someone. Reaching out to someone. And I really do see and sense an urgency in this season right now. Uh, the pandemic is there. It's a wonderful opportunity. It's a, there's urgency. And I believe that there are open doors in this particular season. A few days ago, <coughs> excuse me. A few days ago, uh, Pastor Philip Lin contacted me. And uh, he asked me this. He says, you know, I have a contact, someone who is newly converted, a new believer in Penang. Can your church take him in? Can your church uh, minister to him, follow up with him? Uh, you know, this is very interesting. This person is very steeped in a lot of things. Uh -huh. That's prevented him from coming to know Jesus. And you know how he was converted? He was converted by one of his church members in KK. You know, Pastor Philip Lim pastors SIB Skyline in KK. He was converted by his church member in KK. You know how his church member converted this guy? His church member is a supplier of a home product. And this person is his customer. And he was just over the phone. He booked something, I think it was through internet, he sent it over from KK to his place. And then over the phone spoke to him as a follow-up customer service uh, about the product and shared the gospel. And then after a few calls or all that, led him to Christ over the phone. And we, we contacted him actually, and this guy is very committed. He really gave his life to Jesus. It's amazing. Can you imagine someone from KK could bring Jesus to someone in Penang? And what about us here in Penang? And I'll tell you this, this is not the first time. Over the last couple of years, at least there are three cases I remember. Pastor Philip Lin in his church called me up. And he have, KK, last two years, could convert three people in Penang. Hey, what about us here? You know, I'm not trying to be judgmental or what, but we have to ask ourselves, in the last three years, how many have you converted three? We are right here in Penang, but KK could do that right here. It's really amazing. It's long distance. It's by phone. You know, I, I've been to, you know, he's, one of the things about his church is that the people are very missional. Missional means that every one of them sees themselves as missionaries in their workplace, wherever they are, in their family, in their workplace, wherever they are. They see themselves as a barrier of God's word, as a missionary, that he will bring the gospel to the people. A few years ago, I was in his church, and I saw a group of them, they were all chatting, and then I found they were all bankers. And they were all new believers. So I asked, I said, hey, how come all these bankers in your place are new believers? Oh, he said, because one of their members was a bank manager in KK. So he shared the gospel with his people, his staff, and with uh, his fellow colleagues from bankers from other banks. And all of them gave their life to Jesus, they all came to his church. It, it seems so simple, but at least he made the effort. This guy made the effort and there were fruits because God was with him. And God is with him. And that is important. So there is this, this whole new thing, you know, that they see themselves as a, a missionary in their workplace. And I, I, I believe God's megaphone shouting to us right now. Those of you out there in the marketplace, I want to say to you, you are a missionary where God has placed you. Even when you are retired, even when you are retired, you are still a missionary with your social circle of friends out there, you know. And this is very important. As individuals, we've got to see ourselves in this way. In our context, you know, among our family members, that's our best contact. Among our, whether it's yam cha, kaki. Hey, by the way, if you want to yam cha, try to yam cha more with the non-believers. Huh? Don't just keep to your clique of nothing wrong to build relationship among church members. But it would be wonderful if you yam, yam cha with the non-believers. Yam cha with your ex-colleagues if you are retired. Yam cha with ex-classmates. Yam cha with them. And if you go there, you play golf. I, I know Pastor SK plays golf and he will share the gospel. He has made inroads into some people's life. When you play tennis, when you play this, whatever, you are a missionary in your circle of friends. If you go to your favorite Cha Kui Tiao store or Hokkien store, try to go there, build relationship, talk something. 
This is what we are called to do right now in this season. In this pandemic, God is blasting out this message to the church right now. You know, I sense the urgency. We can no longer procrastinate on this assignment that God is giving us. In many ways, it is not a new assignment. You know, the Great Commission of Matthew 28 has been there. It's been there since the Bible was written. It's been there. And some of us take it seriously, some do not. Perhaps this is a season God is giving us a wake-up call, really through his megaphone to tell us. Just imagine we have 700 plus across four congregations in GBC. If everyone sees ourselves as missionaries out there in the marketplace, wow! I'll tell you, Penang has got seven missionaries from GBC out there. If we work with other churches all over, wow! We've got thousands of missionaries out there in the marketplace. Hey, you don't, you don't have to speak to a big crowd like Billy Graham. You only need to convert one, talk to one at a time. One life at a time. Just one life. That's what you need to do. As a body of Christ, we need to come together. And, you know, if Gideon only needs 300 men to defeat the Midianites, we have 700 plus in GBC. As I will bring this to close, can I have the worship team here? You know, Israel cried to the Lord for deliverer in their season of need. And the Lord sent Gideon. Today, in our city, in our country, and in the world, there's a crying out for help. There's a crying out for answers for redemption in this pandemic season. Who is the Lord going to send? He's going to send you and me. He's going to you and me. He's going to send the church. Today, God is calling out his Gideons, and all of us are Gideons, at God's disposal. This is the first Sunday of December, and the Christmas season is upon us. You know, what is Christmas if it's not about Jesus? Today, what is Christmas about Jesus? If you go to the mall today, you think you'll find joy just shopping. It's pretty dampening, you know. You look at the crowd or the lack of crowd. It's pretty dampening. Hey, I, th- I don't think the atmosphere will be there, not like the previous years. If you, if you want to find joy, if Christmas is all that is all about going to the mall, nothing wrong to go there to pick up some things, nothing wrong. But if your Christmas is centered around the malls, around celebration, meals, nothing wrong per se, but if it's, that's the only thing around turkeys and uh, all those things that are going to eat during Christmas, that's fine. But if that's the only thing that is to you, it's all about Christmas, then I think we're missing out something because what is Christmas if it's not about Jesus? And what is Christmas if people do not know and believe that Jesus came to earth to save us? Really, what is about Christmas? You can be happy and enjoy here and there. You have the fun. Yes, you have the love of God's salvation. But what is that fun if your best friend, your good friends, your colleague, your family members whom you care for, your relatives do not yet know Jesus? Wouldn't that be greater fun in Christmas if together we can celebrate Jesus of this Christmas together? Wouldn't that be greater fun? I always say celebration is best when we celebrate together. When we celebrate with a few, that wouldn't be great. That would be wonderful if it's the whole Penang celebrating Christmas because they all know Jesus. That would have been wonderful. And really, what is Christmas if you do not take up this assignment to tell people about Jesus? I want us to think about this this morning. What is Christmas if we don't take up this assignment to tell people about Jesus? I want to challenge everyone this morning, yeah? those viewing live stream at home, I want to say to you, encourage you, urge you, challenge you to do the following things this Christmas. Number one, I want you to write down the names of people, non-believers, that you will commit to pray for daily, that they will open their hearts and minds to Jesus. Can you do that? Take your private notebook, note down those names, uh, at least one, I'm sure you have one. If you have three, four, five, that's wonderful. Commit them 
to prayer every day in this season. Say, Lord, honor us if you are with me. Huh? That is what Gideon asked. If you are with me, show me, Lord. Empower, empower my prayer. I'm going to pray for these people that their hearts and their minds will be open to Jesus. The second thing I want you to do is this. Talk and share with them. You need to talk and share with them. Uh, just as God asked Gideon, call Gideon. He didn't just call Gideon like that. He called Gideon to go out and fight. There's something we have to do. So talk and share now. If you have problem opening up a conversation to talk with Jesus, give me a text. I'm, as many of you, I'm really received those texts. I'll tell you this. I have enough tracks and booklet that will help you to open up a conversation with non-believers. You text me, we'll make arrangement how you can collect that track and uh, that uh, booklet. You can easily open up. There are questions they ask. You can talk about it and open up a way into their life to talk about Jesus. And finally, no, not finally, the third one, invite them to our service. If we are open, bring them to a service. Hey, Christmas time, just come at once, you know, bring them in, come with them and bring them to the service. If we are not open, we cannot open, then it's view online and send them the link. Follow up, continue to pray with them, for them, and ask them how. And finally, for ourselves, it's a time of reflection to draw even closer to Jesus. And this is important for ourselves. Christmas is also a time for us to draw closer to Jesus. As I said, what is Christmas if it's not about Jesus? And really, finally, a time to really draw near this Christmas and bring non-believer friends if we are open for in-service. All right? This year, as I said, we have decided to cancel um, some programs, but it doesn't matter. God is still with us. Amen? God is still with us. And when God is with us, we, yes, the programs will help. Obviously, when God is in the program, God will be in the program. It will be wonderful. However, plan B, if God is not in the program, God is still present. God can still work through many ways as well. And here we have it that uh, at the end of the day, it's not about just programs. It's about bringing God's presence, drawing these people closer to Jesus. And that's important. And I want to leave this with you. If the Lord is with us, we will make an impact this season. If the Lord is with us, and definitely the Lord is with us this season, if He has allowed the pandemic and sent a mega phone to speak into our pain, God is surely with us. And this is where we will have to take up the assignment. Amen? Man, come, let's pray before uh, we go to this time of uh, worship. Father, I just want to thank you again for this reminder. This Christmas season, it is different. Yes, it's different because of the pandemic, but it will be different because, Lord, your people, men and women of God, that will rise up and take up this assignment. Take up this assignment and say, yes, now is the season, all the more, the time. I'm going to bring the gospel out there and talk about Jesus to those who do not know, yet know you. Father, you are shouting out at us. I, we know, Lord, through this pandemic, the church cannot be the same. It's not about building, it's not about gathering, it's about going out. It's about building communities, impacting communities. It's about ultimately, Lord, that lives must be pulled into your kingdom. That, Lord, the day will come when we celebrate, we celebrate together with our best friends, our good friends, our, our yam chakakis, Lord, our, our relatives and friends that together, Father, we celebrate together in the goodness of Christ. And Lord, hopefully by next Christmas, we will have more people celebrating and we will have programs. We will really, and Lord, trusting that when that day comes, we will all really, really raise our voices and, and shout to you and say, Jesus is our Lord, our Saviour. And it all began at the manger in Christmas time. It all starts at Christmas time. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rise to sing this response. You know, our response to God. Yes. 
Before I close with prayer, I just were viewing online, just want to say that uh, there is, if you need someone that will pray alongside you and uh, you need someone to talk to, there is a button on your right hand side. You can just click uh, continue. It will take you to a room and there'll be somebody who will minister to you, pray with you, talk to you. All right? Okay, come, let me pray. Father, thank you again for the reminder. We are supposed to be apostolic, sent out, people who are sent out. Father, send us out. We are not to stay where we are and not to stay in the church. We are supposed to go out. Father, you disperse us. In the early church, you have dispersed them through persecution. They were dispersed, Lord, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to other parts of the world. They were all dispersed that the gospel may spread. Likewise, Father, in this pandemic, you are dispersing the church, a sense, from, from a central meeting point. You are dispersing us into our marketplace. And I want to pray, Lord, that there's such a stirring in the heart of every member. Lord, that they are all, we are all called people, missionaries where you have places, we are all sent out people, we are all apostolic it's essentially Lord we are all missionaries, Father help us to realise that, thank you Lord I just want to pray that let it come Lord, the empowerment we are going to tap on you that we, our words will be clothed with humility with power, with authority, when we share Jesus, people will catch it it will resonate in their heart, in their spirit Lord, and many will give their life to Jesus Lord, you are more than able, not us but you, you are able, you empower us, thank you Lord, all this in Jesus name and thank you everyone, those of you viewing online uh, via our, our live stream. We want to just welcome you and thank you, not welcome, thank you actually for, for uh, joining us. And goodbye until next week. Bye-bye.